Good afternoon. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, where you'll find a lot of interviews with independent third-party candidates who are going to be on the ballot this November 8th, 2016. Um, In the last two weeks, we've interviewed about 30 people, so I encourage you to take a look at LibertarianProgressive.com and check it out. And right now, we're live at BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel. We're interviewing... Constance Adele Newton of the Green Party uh, running for the Ohio House in District 18. And I have one question to ask people, um, whether you're in Constance's district or in the dis- district that you live in, here's a multiple choice question. Um, are you satisfied with the uh, incumbent or the congressperson or the two-party system uh, that uh, you're under? Um, one, yes, um, you are satisfied and you think they're providing adequate representation to no you think um you know you you want to try something different you think there might be should should be more competition in congress three you don't know and four none of the above well let's talk to constance today and constance good to talk with you today and thank you for joining us on the program and people can by the way find out more information at constance for for ohio Dot com and on our website it says change comes from the roots and um, and how are you today Constance hello thank you I'm great thank you so much for interviewing me I really appreciate we this appreciate, opportunity well we appreciate the opportunity you're giving to your uh, constituents and, um, and and being on the ballot so we can interview you and so well let's um, start with the issues because that is whenever I look at a candidate's website, I usually just jump right to the issues. And, um, you know, uh, some place, some candidates' websites don't even list issues, but um, so you have economics for all, equality, ecological sustainability, respect for diversity, community outreach, educational cornerstone. And so if you could please give us a summary of your issues, um, why you're running also uh, just kind of an introduction to yourself, why you're running this year, have you ran before, and, um, and, and why you're running as a Green Party candidate uh, to give that option to your constituents. Ma'am. Sure, thank you. Again, my name is Constance Goodell Newton, and I'm running for state representative in the 18th district um, of Ohio. And um, I'm a criminal defense attorney in central Ohio. Um, My top issues are public health, um, environmental issues, and um, including um, the the heroin epidemic here in Ohio and issues that we're having with police violence. Um, So as a criminal defense attorney, I see a lot of my uh, my fellow citizens' uh, problems up close and personal, and uh, I really see that a lot of the issues that I see could be caught, um, could be taken care of with better health care. So as far as um, the heroin epidemic, I really believe that drug addiction needs to be treated as a serious health condition and that people need better health care, that the government needs to stop criminalizing people's health conditions. I have clients who are desperate to get drug treatment and resources are not available. Um, I would like to have better resources for drug rehab. Um, And um, so um, as far as, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, please continue. Please continue. I'll I'll ask any follow-up questions after, but yes, please go over your platform. Thanks. Right. So, um, so I really think that um, instead of criminalizing drug addiction, that we need better health care in Ohio. And so um, I would like to see better health, public health resources. Uh, universal health care has been proposed. Um, and uh, I really do think that um, doctors need to help people um, doctors need to help people wean off their meds. So a lot of the heroin epidemic in Ohio was caused by um, people had health conditions or uh, surgeries that required pain medication 
and then they they became addicted to their pain medication. They were never properly weaned off. And so what we've seen in Ohio is that uh, people went from having a legitimate prescription to um, having that uh, prescription drug taken away from them, and so they went to the street to get uh, their pain medication. And then it turned out that heroin was easier to obtain and cheaper than um, their pills. And so um, that that is a, a main issue for us here. Um, turning to environmental issues, um, I really want to make sure that we have the infrastructure here in Ohio to support clean water, clean drinking water for our citizens. Um, there is an anti-fracking movement in Ohio that I strongly support. Um, and we just need to protect Ohio's clean air, water, and soil, and preserve wildlife and natural spaces. Now, I've noticed when I've gone onto the Ohio Department of Natural Resources website that it seems like they are more interested in exploiting our natural resources than conservation. And so if you compare our Ohio Department of Natural Resources to, say, Michigan's Department of Natural Resources, in Michigan, they seemed a lot more focused on conservation, and so I would like to shift that focus. Um, many people don't realize, and I learned this when I was working on um, a civil disobedience case um, regarding a woman who was locked down to prevent frackers from putting, injection, putting toxic waste into a, an injection well near her home. Um, I learned that the Ohio Department of Natural Resources receives funding for every barrel of toxic waste that they accept into the state. Um, and so I, I think that that's really incredible that that's a conflict of interest. They are supposed to be protecting our natural resources and protecting the health of the people who live in Ohio who have to drink water here. So I would like to change the funding model for the ODNR um, to protect our natural resources. We have other problems with water in Ohio. The, the toxic algae blooms um, in the Great Lakes um, and uh, lead poisoning is still an issue here. So it may be uh, kind of boring, but I do want to focus on making sure that we have that infrastructure uh, to ensure that we have um, good um, access to clean water. Yeah, I don't think that's boring at all. Clean water, hands up. And we've seen, you know, Michigan might have some good things going for it, except for, you know, we've all heard about those pipes. So you don't want that to repeat in Ohio. And uh, I think that's something that would interest everyone. And that kind of has to do with health as well. So Absolutely. so far what I've heard is treating the drug war as more of a um, – health issue instead of a criminal issue, maybe the money would be better invested uh, in helping people rehabilitate and, um, and also the environment as concerning water, fracking. Actually, there's a documentary um, that is called, um, is about fracking, and it's called Leaking Frack Wells Are Not Rare. And um, you can YouTube that. Uh, it's called Leaking Frack Wells Are Not Rare. And, um, well, and you have some other issues here about um, local businesses, respect for diversity. How about let's um, talk about uh, equal representation, though, and um, what is your approach to equal representation? Um, what exactly do you mean about equal rep representation? Are you, do you mean, um, it, well, it, the government of the people have voices that need to be heard fairly and, um, and, and equally. Um, so, well, let me ask you this. Um, so one of the things is there's a conflict of interest. And I think a lot of people have that sentiment, um, you know, a lot of people promise a lot of things when they get to uh, the state capitol. What, and maybe being a Green Party candidate and, you know, being a criminal defense attorney, you, you know, you kind of get the sense you have uh, principles, but how would you safeguard that um, you're going to still give people that equal representation and not be caught, you know, in the bubble per se and, you know? 
Okay. Well, yeah, you know, as a Green Party candidate, um, we have a policy within our party that we do not accept corporate donations. And so all of my donations have come from from the people. They've come from people in my district and around my district. And um, I think that this puts me in a good position to fairly represent the interests of my constituency, which are not businesses. Um, it's the people who live in my district. Now, of course, we have business owners in my district as well. And what I've seen since um, the 18th district um, <clears throat> for people who may not know, is right in the center of downtown Columbus, and it goes um, up and down High Street and Broad Street, which is our main intersection in the city. So there, there are a lot of businesses along that corridor, um, and they, I, I really want to promote, as the Green Party candidate, small business, local business, and green businesses. And so... Um, I have seen that through our rough economic times that we've done well in Columbus because we have a strong arts and entertainment community and business community. So we have, um, we have a lot of great restaurants and bars that have employed a lot of people. And so I do want to keep that business community strong, but it's because of the people who are involved in that. So... Um, um, Basically, um, as a Green Party candidate, I'm not beholden to the Democratic or Republican establishment or to business interests. I really do represent the people, not corporations. Um, I have chosen to live in um, a neighborhood that is a diverse neighborhood, that is an integrated neighborhood. Um, Old Town East, which is part of my district, is a historically middle-class black neighborhood. And so I have, um, <clears throat> I have gotten to know uh, folks as neighbors, as clients, um, and seen you know, the needs that people have um, on, on the level of you know, the neighborhoods um, and as individuals. So um, as far as equal representation, I... Um, I feel that I'm able to establish a really personable relationship with individuals. Uh, I'm a good listener. I'm very independent, and I work well with others. I know that there may be some people who are questioning whether a Green Party candidate can work with uh, other politicians to get things done. And I would just say that as an attorney, I already have to work in an adversarial system with people who are different than me, sometimes the prosecutor, I work with judges. I work with uh, indigent clients a lot of times. And so I'm taking um, those, all of those perspectives and trying to come up with a good outcome for the case. And so I am really um, able to work well with others regardless of their political party um, and regardless of our backgrounds. You know, you can certainly have individual conflicts or personality differences with people but in general, I've had a lot of practice at maintaining my own independence and um, working with others to do the right thing. Very well. And if people do elect you, that would be the voice of the people. So, I mean, so that they would deserve for you to be working with everyone else. And <laughs> are there any debates that have been in your district so far with your opponents? Um, and are there any upcoming um, I don't. I don't know that there are exactly debates, but I have been to. Um, I've been invited to several candidates forums, and so I have had the chance to address a nurses association, uh, an organization that advocates for African American women and girls, um, and I will have the chance to go to more of those candidates forums. And so um, it's been very interesting to have all of the other candidates there as well. And it, it really seems like, by and large, regardless of the political party background of those folks, um, we're focusing on a lot of similar things. So we may have some different interests, but I think that we can see that there are certain um, common threads that go, go through um, the political parties and the interests as we're representing the various uh, constituencies. 
And abs- and one unique thing about your campaign is you are the only um, you know third party option in your district. And uh, do you think there should be more competition in the election system? Um, is there any reforms that you know as far as signature gathering or, or things like that, or is it pretty good in Ohio, in your district the way it is? Well, um, you know, I think that um, in our district and in central Ohio, um, I often say that Columbus is kind of a one-party city. And so what we see a lot here in city council um, and other um, um, other races is that people are often appointed to their position. Um, they're appointed and then they're they're the incumbent in the race. And so... Um, that, along with gerrymandering and, you know, and drawing the district mm-hmm. line, it really seems like um, a lot of those races are predetermined and that the voters don't really get to choose. And so one reason that I'm running for this position is because I do believe that the voters have the right to have a choice. You know, ideally, voters should have a choice and get to choose their candidate. They shouldn't just have someone handed to them and told, okay, this is who you vote for because you're Democrat or because you're Republican. Um, so I would, I would like to see a lot more choice and third-party candidates. Unfortunately, in Ohio, Democrats and Republicans have fought pretty hard to remove third-party candidates from the ballot. There used to be five, um, five minor parties in Ohio, including the Libertarian Party, the Constitution Party, the Natural Law Party, and the Socialists. Um, since um, since they've been, you know, trying to take away ballot access, the Green Party is now the only minor party left in Ohio. Um, we have fought hard to maintain our, our ballot status, and I hope that by running in this race, other people will be encouraged to uh, to run as Greens in the future. Absolutely. And you hear the argument always as far as in other aspects in life that we must break up the monopoly. We want to bring in more competition when it comes to, you know, telephone companies or Internet companies. And and if you look at most first world countries, quote unquote, first world countries, that um, most of them have at least four parties in their legislative branches. Um, so maybe, you know, uh, could be some more competition. Let's take a jump here to. Um, uh, the justice system, since um, you, you, you know you have a lot of experience in that. Number one, um, I want to ask you about um, body cameras. Uh, should there should there be body cameras for police officers, and um, should there be an independent internal affairs for um, police departments? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I do think that body cameras could be helpful, um, and that they can help with police accountability. I do um, see that there are ways that police can get around accountability, even with body cameras, but I do think it's a step in the right direction. Um, And as far as an independent review board, I really believe that that's absolutely essential to ensure the safety of the public. Because uh, currently, if someone has a complaint against a police officer, let's say they have a police encounter that didn't go so well, they feel that they were not treated fairly or that they were even physically assaulted by a police officer. Right now in Columbus, um, an individual would report that to the Internal Affairs Bureau. And the Internal Affairs is basically a division of the police department that investigates police complaints. And so it seems that there's clearly a conflict of interest um, that the... Uh, police detectives are protecting their uh, coworkers in some cases, and I think that in general the public is just very uncomfortable with even reporting sometimes for fear that they could end up on a list, um, that they could be blacklisted, and that that could even put them at more risk for police violence. So um, mm-hmm. uh, just uh, to add to the to the uh, conversation about police violence. Um, Unfortunately, the um, Tyree King was the 13-year-old boy who was killed in Columbus just a a week or so ago. And that 
actually happened about three blocks from my house. So um, police violence has been um, a, a problem in Columbus, just like it has been all over the country. And so I have some ideas uh, about um, how we can help resolve that situation. Um, I would I would advocate for nonviolent communication training for police officers, nonviolent de-escalation tactics, um, and some training in something like hostage negotiation, where they are encouraged to prevent the loss of life when they're dealing with tough situations. So, um, in some situations, I think that the police act much too quickly without assessing the situation and trying to find ways to de-escalate the situation to prevent the loss of life. I do think that that should be a goal. Um, no citizen should be in fear of government agents coming to take their life when, um, when clearly that's um, you know, not merited. Actually, those now that you mention it, that's an excellent idea. I think that would be an excellent idea for you, you know anyone who's interested in get, you know obtaining those kind of skills. You know, those would be life skills that uh, you could say. And again, we're talking with um, Constance Gadel Newton. Uh, it's Constance for F O R Ohio dot com. She's running uh, for the um, Ohio house and in district 18 uh, she's gonna be on the ballot this november 8th 2016 and um let me ask you about uh it might not be a big issue in ohio so if it's not just let, let me know but but i saw a recent statistic the other day that asset forfeiture has actually surpassed the amount of reported burglaries and robberies uh recently um should there be more safeguards or due process in regarding asset forfeitures um, so I believe uh, what you're referring to is when some when the police are investigating uh, a drug a drug crime and so they take um, the assets of the person that they're investigating. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that is pretty common, and unfortunately, a lot of people who um, are in that situation just don't know what to do about it, and it seems like. Um, there, you know, it's difficult to find a remedy for that. So, um, my understanding is that some police departments really rely on asset, asset forfeiture for their funding. Um, and I, I mean, I would just I look around and I see that um, some some courts and and police departments are giving tickets you know, speeding tickets for revenue raising, but they're, they're, they're charging court costs and sometimes imposing jail time illegally uh, because people owe court costs uh, and fines. You know, debtors' prisons are supposed to be illegal, yet it still seems like sometimes that is what's going on in the court system. And so I know that this isn't necessarily a popular position, but I would say rather than criminalizing the people and just taking their stuff and ruining someone's life with a criminal conviction, if the government needs funding, maybe that should be dealt with in a more fair way, such as doing something with the tax code so that they have adequate, and they're not just giving people traffic tickets and giving people a record. Um, you know, So I know that people don't want to hear, like, raise taxes, and I mean, I do agree with that, but to me having um, a, a bunch of, of penalties and criminalizing people just to raise revenue to employ people in the government doesn't seem right. Yeah, I think um, you might, I, I don't know who, who would uh, like or not like what you're saying, but, um, you know, I do hear a sense of honesty there that I definitely think people could appreciate. And uh, it does seem like a lot of these are, you know, a lot of these um, organizations are becoming dependents or they, they budget for, you know, these revenue raising type of uh, tactics. Let me ask you this. Do you think most police departments say there's no quotas, but there's been people that have come out and, you know, it sounds like they do have a quota. Do you think there are quotas? And um, if there are, is there a way to stop that? It, it, or am I... 
Yeah, office. I mean, my understanding is that that there are quotas, and you know that there's a lot of pr- pressure to meet certain budgetary needs, and so. Um, I would just say also look at the privatization of prisons. So when you have um, a private prison and it's a private corporation that is entrusted with the duty of giving uh, punishment to people who've done something wrong, I I don't necessarily want somebody punishing me for a profit because the, the more they punish me, maybe the more money they get for it. And if there's a profit motive there, I I also think that there's a conflict of interest. So, um, you know, I just I have a real problem with with that. You see private prisons who have um, an incentive to uh, promote the criminalization of marijuana so that they can keep their beds filled, and so you see um, private prisons weighing in on policy. Um, and I would just say that that policy has very little to do with actually maintaining order in our society. They're getting paid to lock up American citizens and punish us, and I just feel that that's really wrong. Um, One of my top goals as a defense attorney and as potentially a politician is to protect civil liberties and civil rights. And um, so I do that every day at work. I protect the Constitution. Uh, protect the rights of my clients as much as I can. Um, it's very difficult work sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm sure you have a lot of thankful, thankful clients. And 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 what you do to help one client might help set a precedent to help others as well. And just like the issue of private prisons goes beyond just private prisons, it goes into the issue of lobbying and things like that as well. So it's not always just a one issue topic um let me just ask you two questions that a lot of local areas uh you know have a question about what about um property taxes uh do you think um you know sometimes i hear stories of people that can't pay their property taxes and i'm not saying people should be for or against them but it's just uh you hear some stories of people losing their houses because they can't afford to pay the property tax um do you think there's uh, any reform or anything, you know, is that in the, you know, something that you would look at? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly we don't want people losing their homes um, because of taxes or other policies that are burdensome. Um, that would be something that I would probably need to look more into. Uh, I am absolutely, um, you know, committed to protecting the the citizens in my district and in the states of Ohio. Um, So um, I I want to promote affordable housing and sustainable development. Um, I live in a neighborhood that has seen a lot of gentrification. And so you have um, lower income folks who have been in the neighborhood here for 40 years and then um, people have decided to come in and gentrify the neighborhood. And while some development is definitely necessary and positive, I think what we don't want to see is pushing out neighbors who have been here because they can't afford uh, their property taxes or they have other um, like environmental court actions because maybe um, their home needs repairs and so the court is telling them they have to repair their home or lose it. So um, I would definitely be looking at um, fairness to ensure that people are able to stay in their homes. Um, we want to make sure that, um, that the people in the state are taken care of, um, that they have housing, they have their basic needs met, and um, they're not facing um, an overly oppressive government situation. Right, and I think that kind of answers the same question I was going to ask about um, eminent domain. I mean, pretty much the same answer there, I would guess. Um, y- yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, pretty similar. Y- you know, it- it's important to have fairness for people to have due process. Um, and so I, I think that um, we need to always be on guard to make sure that people are being treated fairly and that individual citizens who um, have a home 
are being treated fairly and that they're not being disrupted and destabilized in their daily lives. All right. All right. And just a few more questions. And again, we appreciate your time very much to enlighten our audience about different options that are out there. You know, when they watch the regular um, media, usually you just hear about Republicans and Democrats. In fact, right now you're mostly just hearing about the presidential campaign. And we want to let people know that there's a lot more going on and a lot more choices that are going to be on the ballot on November 8th besides just the presidential elections. Let me ask you a philosophical question here, if that's all right. Um, is it whether you win or lose or how you play the game that's more important? Well, um, I am running to win, but um, I'm an activist. And so I feel that as a Green Party candidate, that um, how you run is very important. And I feel that um, on election night, I'm going to be having a victory party no matter what. So, um, you know, just given statistics, um, I'll, I'll be lucky if I score in the double dis digits compared to other Green Party members. But I do think that this is a winnable race, um, and I am running to win. And um, I would just say that I've had a lot of fun in this election cycle. I've really enjoyed meeting people and speaking out about the issues. And I feel that even if um, even if I don't win or if a minor party candidates don't win, that we can influence the political dialogue. We can bring new ideas to the table. And um, when I've gone to these candidate forums, it's not only the public who are hearing me speak about these ideas, but it's also the other people who are running for office. And so I really hope to influence them and the political dialogue as well as the general public. Yeah, and one unique thing about your campaign is that you have an opportunity to build more consensus um, since you're the only third-party candidate. Actually, we've interviewed two other people kind of in a similar situation, um, Napoleon Bell and Stephen Spoonamore. They're also running uh, for the Ohio uh, House, and uh, they're independents, but they're the only third-party option in their district as well. So, so uh, you know, people in Ohio are going to see some yeah. options there. Um, so again, and we're talking today with Constance, um, Constance Gettel Newton, uh, Constance for F O R Ohio.com where you can find out more information. Just in closing, I just want to ask you, and you can put this in one answer. You, you did have education on your platform here, so we don't want to go without you, uh, saying how you might improve the education system. And I just am going to ask you also, who are some of your favorite people, past or present, um, elected or not? Okay. Um, so on education, I do believe in promoting um, a good, basic, quality education for all students in Ohio. Um, I would promote mostly public education, although I do see that um, there is a role for online and charter schools as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I work in the juvenile system as well, so I work with children who um, sometimes have truancy issues or issues at home. And so I think that um, there, there is a role for charter schools, but in general, I want to promote public education. And um, I really think that that has to start early. I would love to see Head Start programs um, so that um, working moms can can know that their three or four year old is getting a good quality preschool and getting ready for kindergarten. Um, and so I, I, I really think that it starts, it has to start early. Also, um, I think that we need to be preparing our students for college and we need to be nurturing our gifted and talented students in the state. So um, I would promote gifted and talented programs and um, college readiness. Um, All right, and and the final question yeah. was, um, who's some of your favorite people, past or present, elected or not? Well, um, somebody who comes to mind um, is Martin Luther King Jr., um, and I would just say that I feel incredibly lucky to live in Columbus, where I see that my neighbors, black, white, gay, straight. Um, families and 
all different kinds of people seem to come into Columbus and all interact peacefully together. Um, when I go out in the neighborhood, um, I see um, um, I see interracial couples at restaurants and a lot of you know a lot of people getting along. Where I think that um, you know that's not necessarily always talked about as much, but I I feel like racism is certainly still a problem in our society. It's undeniable that to me that a lot of the police violence um, seems to be racially motivated. On the other hand, I think that um, we all have something to fear when government actors are killing people. So um, I really um, I really admire Dr. Martin Luther King and am happy to um, see that it, to some extent, we are able to live out Martin Luther King's dream. All right, awesome. And thank you so much for taking the time. We appreciate it greatly and uh, for enlightening our audience about the different options that are going to be on the ballots in November 8, 2016. Uh, Constance, uh, good luck in your campaign. And thank you for taking the time to join us today at uh, libertarianprogressive.com. And again, your website one more time is Constance for for ohiocom Thanks again. Yes, thank, thank you again so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, find me on Facebook, Constance Goodell Newton, and uh, the website is Constance for Ohio. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. I really do appreciate it. Good luck. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. All right.